honor uh, to be on stage with, uh, with Abhijit Banerjee and Shahin Olivier. Uh, when I first got this book, uh, the first thing that struck me was the, the utter gorgeousness of the illustrations. So I thought I'd begin this conversation with Shahin first because that's what struck me about the book before I started reading. Uh, into the delightful stories and the, the recipe and the fact that this is not just a recipe book but also a book about social science but in a very very gentle and non-preachy manner as well. So Shine, my, my first question to you is the um, when I first saw the illustration for masala peanuts in this book um, it, only then it struck me that the the brown was for the peanuts and the yellow was for the, the inside of the peanuts and then the purple for the onions um, and, and then the, the green triangles uh, for the chilies and so on. Um, and then I slowly went back and started looking at every picture. I actually spent a lot of time treating them almost like puzzles, if you will. Um, how, did you, how, how did you sort of arrive at this art style, illustration style for this uh, unique book? I, I am so glad you picked this up because it's, it's exactly how I, I worked. I, I thought that after all, is a, recipe, is a, a recipe is a set of ingredients and uh, a very limited set of ingredients after all. We roughly use the same spices, the same vegetables, the same ingredients, and then you just cut them, slice them, arrange them in, in different ways, and that's what I wanted to do with very basic, yeah. I guess, thank you. with um, somehow the basics of, uh, of illustrations. After all, we make images out of squares, circles, and triangles. So I did exactly the same thing. I chopped them and I added some colors and I mixed them. And so that's exactly how I built it as a puzzle and I, as a game to myself also, because one of the things we emphasize in the book is that uh, cooking should be something that you take pleasure in. So I thought I should take pleasure in doing the illustrations first time. So cooking with geometric shapes, literally, uh, to, count exactly. up, to, to go with the recipes. Abhijit, I think the, uh, one of the first things that struck me about the book was the eclectic and global nature of the recipes. Uh, influences from everywhere, but also even within individual recipes, elements of, say, an Andhra-style pork ribs, for example, or a, a rosemary lamb chops and so on. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on what you think about fusion food, if that word means anything at all, but specifically from the point of view of the contemporary idea that somehow there is something called authentic food and then there is the rest, right? Uh, so what thoughts on fusion and authenticity in food? Uh, that's an amazingly good question. Uh, um, we did write a piece uh, in Condinas Traveler a few months ago, which we we tried to slightly navigate this very politicized space. So it was, it's, a, it's a space where, uh, you know, you, there is the whole question of cultural appropriation where you're stepping on. And, and I think the, the, maybe the resolution that we agreed on, but I don't know that anybody else would agree with us, <clears throat> is that uh, you, what you're looking for is ideas. So if every cuisine has a certain set of the Indian cuisine, for example, has a wonderful set of strategies for dealing with, you know, I, I want to have cabbage. Cabbage is, let's say the cabbage is old and not very juicy. How do, what do I do to, to fight that? And th those ideas are much more transportable than a cuisine uh, culinary style. You don't necessarily want to, uh, you know, cook uh, thoran in a, in a, in a Spanish style, but you want to see what is the trick in the Thoran and adapt it. And so that distinction I found useful uh, in thinking about that. Now, I think that's a, it's a beautiful point you make that uh, in case of a lot of cuisines, it's about uh, the techniques and processes that are unique, not so much the ingredients. I mean, you know, so Calicut being the place where Vasco da Gama came to India, um, and the fact that the Portuguese introduced many of the ingredients that we eat today from potatoes to chilies to tomatoes and Indian food wouldn't be Indian food without those. Uh, do you see a distinction between people <clears throat> saying that uh, this is authentic food? At, at, at what point would you say, yeah, it's okay to talk about authenticity versus at what point do you say it's like... I, I think that <clears throat> exactly the point you're making, which is that 
everything we think authentic or was invented often 50 years ago. Exactly. I mean, <coughs> chicken tikka masala was invented in England, uh, apparently, um, 50 years ago, uh, and is the sig signature Indian dish in the world. You can find it everywhere. And it, it has to be that there's something, something we learn from that experience. We learn that somehow the, the degree to which the authentic is uh, constructed by reverse engineering the, the present is is a very it's a very big danger uh, and uh, it's not a danger but it's it is a, it, uh, one needs to be aware of the fact that a lot of what we call authentic is reverse engineered from the present we have aspirations now from which we build a narrative that goes and uh, you know reinterprets history absolutely so so Cheyenne I think uh, as as a modern day artist who presumably uses digital tools and social media and uh, for those of you uh, who have it already you should check out her tumblr page i mean it's got some really really astonishing artwork uh, i want you to sort of talk about what you think is the impact of social media and uh, and our relationship to food particularly as a as a person who's a visual artist we, we sort of see a certain way in which food is presented and photographed and looks hyper real. And one of the elements of the book in the preface is about getting away from that ultra real fake idea of what a specific dish looks like. Do you think social media broadly, you know, what are the sort of pros and cons you see in terms of how it's distorted our relationship with food? I, I think we are often caught in between a, a, a vision of food that is hyper-realistic that is very concentrated on the, the product and only the product that completely abstracts away the, the context, the people making it, the people enjoying it, uh, the, the way it is being done. And on the other hand, we, we have a very catastrophic uh, vision of food, the fact that we are uh, going to get out of food, uh, the focus on, on some cookbooks, you have a, a whole ton of cookbooks on um, on focusing on the producers, on the, the quality of the ingredients, etc. And what we wanted to do was to bit, uh, to go in between, to focus on the product, but also on the context. And that's where the illustrations are, are um, helpful because they can actually construct the situations. While photography is very useful in uh, in getting this hyper-realistic vision of plates that are, uh, that are almost uneatable. So I think, it, I think it's, um, maybe there is a place here for illustration to, to offer a much more moderate uh, view of, uh, yeah, of our relation to food. It thoughts, Abhijit, on social media and how it's distorted our... Uh, you, 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 I am I'm not on social media. I know nothing about it. It would be irresponsible of, for me to say anything. I'm going to move on. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the fact that you're not on social media is probably why you're so incredibly productive. So, uh, but on that note, I think... Uh, Someone who plays the violin, cello, <laughs> uh, who cook, writes cookbooks and runs a company. Come on. <laughs> yeah, so, um, sort of get to um, one specific chapter in your book uh, that, again, I, as a South Indian, I absolutely identify with, which is the chapter on rice. Um, South and East India are largely rice-based, and, and the North and West uh, tend to be a little bit more wheat-based, and um, also a larger dairy culture um, in that part of the world, uh, and, and thus, therefore, also the predominant number of vegetarians tend to be in the North and the West. Uh, the South and the East tends to be a lot more seafood, uh, and then more meat-eating, uh, and so on. So. Uh, specifically around the, the history and the economics of rice itself, in the, given what we've seen with the, the Bengal famine and we've seen food shortages in the last the century and so on in South India. Uh, and the rise, obviously, of things like the, the white revolution for dairy and the green revolution for hybrid crops and so on, leading to now where there is, at least among the rich and privileged, there is this sort of feeling that this process, this overly modified uh, hybrid varieties, they're not good for us. So there seems to be this posturing about uh, uh, somehow that, you know, this whole idea of how like in Europe, uh, white bread used to be what the posh people ate. 
but now it's what the poor people eat. Uh, so do you, what your thoughts, Raja, you know, economic thoughts on how uh, these kinds of things affect our relationship uh, to food, specifically in the context of something like, say, rice and all of its varieties and whether white rice is overly polished, it's not healthy, uh, the native varieties are dying out and so on, but, you know, can we feed everyone? So what, what kind of, what are the things that you think about when, when it comes to something like that? Uh, excellent question. I don't know that I can do justice to it. I'll say something, but it's a, it's a deeper question than I can answer. Certainly not in, in now, but even if I spend some time on it, it's, it's really a, a very deep question. Um, it seems to me that there are two tensions there. One is the tension between um, what is uh, environmentally sustainable and, and what is um, well, what is not? I think it's one tension, and there I think rice is really uh, extraordinarily guilty. I, I think we we sort of the even if you think that you know traditional varieties have no other merits, the fact that they are natural uh, to environments where rice growing is uh, natural, for example, you know the east and the south. Yeah, whereas in Punjab, in Punjab, roughly every liter of rice, uh, every kilo of rice, takes three times as much water uh, as a kilo of rice grown in Orissa. So that, that's, and Punjab is water scarce. So, you know, the water table in Punjab is falling uh, sometimes 2.5, <coughs> one inch, uh, one, one inch a uh, year. So the, the water table is crashing. It's, the Punjab government had a report which said by 2040 there will be no water table left. Uh, we're growing rice, all of the basmati rice, which is sort of the high-end rice, is, uh, is grown there. So I think there's a huge environmental challenge which itself calls for rethinking uh, what's, what should be the posh rice. Then I think there is the, a food dimension to it, which is all, uh, you know, which is, uh, has a nutrition dimension which you mentioned, but I'll, I'll mention one other one which is that uh, it's for many dishes, basmati is the wrong rice. It's, it, it doesn't have the right texture. It doesn't have the right surface area. It doesn't have the, a lot of the, for example, the, um, uh, you know, some of the, uh, I won't use the South Indian word, but I'll get it wrong. The, uh, the great Tamil ri rices have a very hard core and a soft outside. And the hard core is what keeps the glycemic index down, and the soft outside is what absorbs sauces. This is, a, this is really critical because you want to both have rice that actually talks to the sauce, and you want to have rice that's actually good for you. And in uh, some ways, we, 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 there is a lot of, uh, it's also just the fact that for eating certain kinds of foods, eat, not making a pilaf, but making, eating with a sauce, you want a different kind of rice. We've sort of forgotten that the, the price is to serve, is to complement what we're eating. So I'll, I'll leave it there. It's, this is an endless conversation. But. Absolutely. I think, you know, uh, as, as a Tamil person, I can absolutely confirm that it does not work for curd rice. Uh, basmati rice absolutely does not. Um, and it's interesting you mentioned some of the local biryanis, at least in this part of the world, Tarasheri, Calicut, and so on, they do use a different samba rice, which is, which is, which is significantly better than basmati for many of these uh, uh, cases. So, uh, Shine, on the uh, sort of switching back to uh, art in the context of food, um, as uh, one of my hobbies is playing around with AI, artificial intelligence tools to generate art and, and off-late generate entire text and columns and so on using these tools. Um, I, for one of my columns, I needed, a, I needed an illustration uh, and I, I just typed uh, a tiger dressed like Genghis Khan cooking barbecue. That was just what I typed. And, and the tool gave me a pretty convincing looking tiger that looked like Genghis Khan cooking barbecue. Um, so given where we are, um, as we go forward in the world, where, how do you see this distinction? How do you sort of draw the line between what AI can do and what genuinely a human being can do when it comes to uh, art and as an artist, have you been thinking about it? Well, I think we shouldn't uh, oppose uh, AI-generated art versus traditional art. 
Uh, I'm on the more traditional side, but I, I really have no problem with AI art. We just should acknowledge that this is not the same thing and not doing the same job. And AI, you, you feed it uh, some keywords, you feed it uh, uh, onions, uh, rice, uh, uh, garlic, uh, uh, mustard oil, and it will generate something that is the, the exact right answer for that. What you, it's not that you, you miss it, but the one thing you do when you work with an actual illustrator, with a, a human, is, um, is a conversation, which uh, you won't have a conversation with an AI. You are asking a question to the AI, and the AI is answering. It, it's a valid uh, form of art, and people enjoy it and, and should. What an illustrator does is, uh, is, first, it's not at all visual, is to understand what the author means, and so it's, it's first, it's carefully reading what you are going to illustrate. And I very carefully read uh, Abhijit's uh, book and text to understand also what he's trying to achieve and how can I best convey that and echo that in the illustrations. But at the same time, I'm offering a different kind of answers. I'm offering my own commentary on uh, what I think food is and or what uh, I think the, the, the plate should look like. So it's really, it's just a different, it's a very different thing. So it's not, it's competing in the sense that, for example, if you don't have the money to actually pay an illustrator to do the job, you can either pay him or her badly or you can uh, uh, use the AI. It will cost you nothing and, and for, uh, for newspapers or even for publishers, it's, it's a very convenient uh, tool. Um, but I think you won't get the same, the same depth or at least a variety because when you read the book, then as a reader, you can also come back between the illustrations and the text, and you can also be part of the conversation. So I just think it's, it's different. Absolutely. I think it's, a, it's an evolving space. And I, uh, every time I, I, as a technologist, I, I would say that, no, AI can't do this. I tend to be proven wrong every few months. But I want to sort of extend that question uh, to you as a, uh, from a larger economic standpoint. Um, and maybe we can keep the conversation maybe around, like for example, not just AI related art. It is pretty obvious automation is coming to kitchens, uh, at least commercial kitchens. Um, and, uh, and I think it was, I forget, was some economists who a long time back pointed out that the quality of a, any region's cuisine seems to be inversely correlated with how unequal the society is. That the more, the more people you can exploit and make them cook food for you, the more, more lovely the cuisine is going to be. Uh, so in that sense, as we kind of see automation coming in and, and perhaps even cooking robots and cooking assistants and so on, uh, how, how do you, having worked with a range of people, particularly from the, the poorest sections of the uh, society around the planet, how do you see automation specifically, maybe even specifically in Ford, how, how do you think it's going to hit them? Oh. <laughs> You 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 go going from big question to bigger question to <laughs> infinitely big questions. Okay, I, uh, I again, I, I, it's that's a long conversation. Uh, I, I think that the, uh, there, I think one one piece of this which I think we, one should not be nostalgic about is I think personally I love the fact that my food processor can grate uh, a carrot in 20 seconds, uh, four, four carrots in 20 seconds, and I can make a, a, a carrot salad in 20 seconds. Uh, that's, uh, that's really extremely, so I, I think one shouldn't be sentimental about all the things that you know my, our grandmothers did by hand. I mean, some of those things, I think, for example, I don't know of any technology that can grind mustard as a Bengali. Well, I grind my mustard by hand, and uh, you get the creaminess out of it. You'll never get it by any, and there's no machine that currently exists that will do that. They're better than the mortar and pestle. The mortar and pestle is an excellent machine for that. So I, I do think that there is uh, some, is a reasonable set of things that we could, uh, we are already, st we, I mean, the automation, it ha is coming, it's already come. Uh, you know, I don't cut my, uh, I don't grate my carrots by hand. So that's part of it. Part of it is also that, you know, I think one should not be nostalgic about uh, annoying jobs. 
I th uh, now, having said that, I, I do think that we have un we've massively underestimate the value of jobs. Um, I'll tell you something from my life as an economist. There's a very nice experiment in Bangladesh with the Rohingyas, okay, um, in, the, in the refugee camps where they're not allowed to work. Um, uh, the experiment is uh, by um, um, a professor at Harvard, her uh, name is Rashma Hussam, who was one of my PhD students some years ago. She, what she do, does is she offers them a job at, let's say, you know, seven, uh, you know, 70 taka uh, an hour, or offers them to give them 100 taka an hour if they're for doing nothing. And almost everybody wants a job at 70 taka an hour. People really find meaning in doing things. And we should not underestimate how much of that is something that we have no other way of offering in society. That it, it, there's things that it looks, you know, peeling potatoes looks boring, but beats doing nothing. Yeah. And you, you find ways of doing it that you much faster than everyone else. You take satisfaction in it. There's really many, many dimensions of satisfaction that we, we need to, as economists, we, we have absolutely no vocabulary for this. But unfortunately, it's a first order concern. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, my, my, my grandmother used to say that those who romanticize hard labor in the kitchen usually do not do hard labor in the kitchen. So. There is that as well. But I think the, um, which kind of brings me to my, my possibly my favorite topic and also something that many of the recipes in this book uh, are all, there's a lot of, seems to be a lot of inspiration from street food, right? There's chart and many of the other examples of things that you say. I want you to talk about street food in general. And I, you know, one, I, I'm always reminded of uh, Anthony Bourdain who, one always recommends that uh, you go to a new city, skip the fine dining buffet and just go eat the street food. It will not make you sick. It's usually deep fried. It's almost always fresh and so on. So talk us a little bit about your sort of uh, your passion and your interest in street food and what makes it so joyful specifically. I, I, I think that one very um, critical um, ambition we had in this book was to actually uh, try to give people a sense of how to maximize um, impact per minute spent on it. It's really, it's an economics question, but it really was, uh, that's how I cook. I, I really, uh, you know, I cook for every day. I cook for, you know, our family and guests, and I often cook four dishes uh, and I have an hour an or an hour and a half to finish dinner. These children have to eat and go to school, uh, sleep and go to school in the morning. So it's really not, it's not an option to take six hours. So w within that set of constraints, uh, you, you have to sort of figure out how to get a meal that people will still be, you know, impressed by. And I think the great thing about street food is that it, you, they just have... The, the, they don't have the time. No, you can't tell people, wait 20 minutes, I'm going to deliver this to you because there's no place to wait in the streets of India or the streets of Mexico City. Or, there's no place to wait. So you really have to deliver in three minutes. So it, it is it, the discipline of delivering a massive amount of impact on very, in very quick time is really the, the discipline that I'm always... So that's my fundamental, if you like, inspiration is that I, I want to have the impact street food has, but ne not necessarily cook only very sharp things or only, that's the, the challenge. The street food, what they do is they solve it by having deep fries and, and tart and sharp and sweet, but really not things which have a more nuanced flavor. So the challenge for someone like me is I want to have nuanced flavors, I want to do it as fast as street food. True, I think, you know, speed is, is indeed the uh, the thing about street food that one of the things that makes it attractive. Uh, Shine. No, just, just to, yeah. just to, uh, but it's the, not just speed, it's a strategy of picking the right dishes and to pick the right flavoring agents so that you can hit high, high frequency flavors exactly. yeah. very quickly. And that's the challenge comes from not taking that path to, to you know, to get 
quick flavors, strong flavors, but not necessarily just tamarind and chaat masala. Yeah, exactly. I, I, it actually reminds me, um, last year I went to Udaipur um, and I'm visiting after almost 15 years or so. Uh, 15 years ago when I went to Udaipur, street food, you could eat chaat, you could eat, you know, aloo parathas and so on. Uh, now, at least anecdotally, 50% of all of the street food places are idli and dosa. Now, you would not expect that in, as a South Indian that to be the case in Udaipur. But again, it's simple economics. An idli batter is easily available. You can make 200 idlis in one shot. A paratha is very linear and you need four people to sit and make it. And so they opt uh, to make the things that... Uh, so, uh, Shane, one, one particular interesting question that I wanted to ask you, again, as, and we had this fantastic lunch today at, at Paragon. Um, and uh, you are vegetarian and you have been vegetarian for a while. Okay, so slightly tricky question. So in your experience and now having visited India and obviously having encountered Indians who are vegetarians as well, do you think this, do you see a difference between uh, somebody in the West who's always historically had a high per capita meat consumption becoming a vegetarian um, and Indian idea of vegetarianism per se. Do you see, so do you, have you, what have you noticed as, as someone who is who's from outside of India? I come from, uh, I come from the Basque country, which is a, a place where you, you could eat cold cuts basically all day. So I, and I was raised as a vegetarian, so I, we never ate fish or meat out of my parents' ideology. So it was very, it was very uh, hard to uh, grow up in such an environment. So the, the first time Abhijit cooked uh, Indian food, it, it felt wonderful because actually the only thing we know about Indian food in France is, is tikka masala, <laughs> poulet tikka ma chicken tikka masala. So I, I, never, uh, I never even imagined that there was such a variety of, uh, of vegetarian dishes and especially Bengali vegetarian dishes. They were, I, I know in India, uh, Bengalis are not known particularly for being vegetarian, but um, and I, I like the, the idea that uh, you, you could have a, a vegetarian dish, but actually with some little bits of um, fish to flavor or some bits of uh, meat, because I, I've had so many friends who became vegetarian from uh, one day to the other and who actually love the taste of uh, meat and who after a few days or a few weeks, not only they are doing their... Uh, their vegetarian diet badly because they, they, they just do it out of uh, out of fashion and uh, so and then after that they drop it and they go back to uh, a fair amount of, of meat maybe too much so I, I'm much more for a, a mild version of uh, vegetarianism and I, since I've known Abhijit I actually tried many meat dishes and fish dishes and I, I got more used to the taste but again in a very and I think it's, it's the most sustainable uh, path, both uh, in India and in the rest of the world. And we should actually, I, I, I wish someone would bring uh, all those wonderful dishes to France to, to make it just, maybe, maybe the, the dishes that we can do with, for example, cauliflower, carrot, cabbage, the, the things that we have and we are used to at home. Uh, Carilla is very hard for a French palate to start with, but uh, I, I would love to see that. Your thoughts on Indian vegetarianism? Uh, yeah, so I, I think I want to echo something Shane said, which is that I think uh, there are all kinds of reasons for being vegetarian, and some of them are, are principles that people hold dearly. I'm not even... I, I, I don't see why not. People should have... Uh, this is a very private space and I'm very, very much uh, respectful of whoever wants to be 100% vegetarian. Uh, I think this point Shane is making though, is, which I see as being a great insight, not just of India, but of India and East Asia and, and Southeast Asia, is that it's really meat serves two purposes in in the diet. One is you eat meat, you, you get lots of fat and calories from it. The other is meat or shrimps or fish are wonderful flavoring agents. They, they have incredibly dense fl flavor, flavor, they're very flavor dense. A tiny bit of meat will lift uh, a dish 
uh, a Chinese dish, you, you flavor, um, for example, uh, you were a Sichuan dish called dry fried, uh, dry fried uh, green beans. You put about half a kilo of green beans, you combine it with 100 grams of, of pork, uh, ground pork, and you get something wonderful. It's, it's, and that idea that a tiny bit of meat or fish or shrimp can really, I mean, in Bangla, uh, Bengal, we, Bengal, we have these things called lao chingri, which is low-key um, bottle gourd with, with shrimps. And it's like, you, 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 and it's the kind of thing that, you know, people who can't afford any, anything else, they'll buy the cheapest small shrimps and 10 of them. And just fry them, and then in that oil hill, they'll cook the, cook the uh, bottle gourd, and you're going to get something wonderful with the flavoring of the shrimps. Or you use dried, dried fish, very cheap. You buy, uh, you know, uh, just dried salted fish, you put it in, the, in it, and you make eggplant. Uh, that's just, and it's incredible the amount of richness you get from it. And in many ways, I think, to come back to Shane's point, uh, it's really critical insight if we are going to balance the people's desire for these kinds of flavors with the environmental imperatives that we know are, you know, the the fisheries are getting overfished. The world, uh, the carbon uh, em em emitted by cows is an enormous part of the car carbon that uh, is, um, you know, making us, getting us into global warming. It's really critical that we resolve this tension. And I think one of the great uh, and convenient insights of, you know, Indian and South Asian and South uh, Southeast Asian and uh, East Asian food is you don't need a kilo of meat. You need 50 grams of shrimps. And, or in, in Thailand, they use dried shrimps for many things. And 25 grams of dried shrimps will get you a long, long, long way. And, and I think you, one of the points you make in your book is about how most Indians are actually mostly vegetarian in that the per capita consumption of meat is still very small. It's increasing, but it's still very small. But, uh, extremely small, and, and maybe we should keep it there. I mean, it's really a, a very uh, a great insight that we can make all the, get all the great flavors of meat without really having to eat a kilo of it. I, I, I really wish we appreciate when we are lucky. It's also that then you, you, you get away from extremely uh, elaborate and maybe too complicated ways of, uh, of replacing meat. Uh, because you, after all, uh, you like the taste, you like the, the texture, but in the end, uh, you, uh, you, you cannot get uh, people there out of uh, restriction. And that, that's, that goes back to the, the, the theme of uh, pleasure that goes throughout the book and that is, uh, is present in the text and the images. Is you, this is by, by the taste and the pleasure you, you take to eat together and to eat good food and simple food that uh, eventually... Uh, this can continue. Absolutely. So, um, which brings me to this uh, recent bit of news about uh, uh, Noma. Right? Uh, for for the uninitiated, Noma is is one of those uh, was one of those restaurants that has been on the list of world's greatest restaurants for the better part of the last decade. Right? They've won it like several times, three Michelin stars, and it's the kind of place where you know you can eat something like. Uh, duck brain inside a skull with pine cones and reindeer moss and things like that, right? It's, uh, it is, even before you eat anything, uh, there's a certain titillation of just the creativity of what they are going to give you. And then you hopefully you will sort of, you know, enjoy the dish and so on. So, Abhijit, wanted to get your thoughts on where do you see fine dining, this kind of high performance you know, dramatic fine dining, where, where is it going and, you know, is it, you know, what are the problems with it and, you know, is it, uh, is it just purely a place for culinary creativity or is it, is it just, is it gone to some place else? So I think clearly, I mean, many of the ideas that, for example, Noma brought to the table were valuable ideas. There were ideas about, you know, 
let's find the you know the, the local ingredient which happens to be in if you are in denmark it's like nothing uh, you know so you, you have the few things that grow so you have to go in the sea and pick, pick pick out some seaweed or something and so i think there is something that's deeply insightful about the idea that you want to want to use uh, local ingredients and find uh, be uh, you know open and creative and think about what those ingredients uh, can do and can't do i think there's something wonderful about that i think where i think the big danger is uh, and i think that's sort of been hi now being highlighted in a number of articles about noma for example is exactly that uh, then there is this whole question of how do i once i have made that statement everybody can copy that everybody can get the cv so you have to keep competing and i think this is the michelin culture also which encourages people from for being you know for be the very marginal innovation that other people have not done bring it to the table and you get that extra star and that that seems to me to be perverse because it's so, in ma many ways uh, what, what these articles which you probably haven't read them but if you have read them you notice that is are about is that this means that the whole cooking enterprise becomes not about the pleasure of cooking but about the the intense emotional battle for getting a dish ready so it's like you need 16 people sous chefs who you yell at you kick in kick them in the groin these are all in the, from the article to to keep them in discipline so that they do the job exactly right they, it needs to be needs to be perfect everything has to be like done exactly as to the chef specification it becomes an obsession and the and i think that the, the whole culture of michelin stars has encouraged that obsession of being because it's not everybody can have it you're competing against others you want to be in the top 50 or the michelin star and to do that you have to go take that extra step and since the really valuable steps are easy to copy uh, the idea of you know using seaweed is easy to copy well, the, you the, the way you really make a difference is by changing the architecture finding that uh, extra moment of blowing the pepper into a bubble and putting it on top which you, you they did 16 bubbles before the one that they put on top of the food actually didn't explode and you have someone whose job is to blow that bubble you know it's all of those things which are mostly foofy and don't really add very much to the flavor but add a lot to time and i i think that that i think the problem is not so much with you know being innovative or you know it's it's the pressure of being in that small tiny bracket in some ways if we abolish mission stars i think we would have and that's there's, a, there's already a movement uh, people are refusing to take the mission star yeah. i mean it's it's funny how the whole thing originated in france as a tire companies need to get people to drive outside paris to <laughs> To, to go find a small farm-based restaurant and you know wear out their tires on those bad roads and now we're like you know we take this to be the the absolute you know uh, rating of what cons what what we consider to be fine food and so on so a uh, couple of things so when we um, <clears throat> this being 2022 it's only fair that uh, i crowdsourced some questions on instagram today morning and uh, I, I told them that well you know uh, if you ask me a really smart question you will have the benefit of me telling your Instagram handle name and ask that question to Abhijit and Shai. Um, and, and so the, the question I've selected is from Puneet Hore on Instagram. And then there's a couple of other questions from the audience here. All right. And Puneet Hore's question is, as an economist, what do you think about the increasing tension between the fact that nutritious food is often not cheap food? Yeah. I think nutritious food could easily be cheap food. I, I, I don't think that that tension exists. What exists is the fact that, you know, the economies of scale and this, for example, in India, the subsidies, what gets subsidized? Wheat and rice. We don't subsidize bajra, we don't subsidize jowar, we don't subsidize ragi. Uh, so you get this, the structure of the subsidies encourages huge overproduction of wheat and rice. So as a result, the public distribution system then gives away wheat and rice. So we, we, we have an entire structural pressure 
against the nutritious food. So I, I don't think that it's a, it, I don't think there's a necessary reason why, you know, you have to go to health food stores to get, uh, if you are in Delhi, you don't usually in a market, you won't get bajra. Uh, you have to get it to go to a health food store. And then you pay for 14 times the price you would have paid uh, in a market in, in, uh, in, in you know, Satara or someplace where they actually eat that all the time. I, I think that that's, that's, that's a, it's a result of the fact that uh, partly our diets are, collectively diets are switched in a particular direction and partly the subsidy structure that the government has implemented. So in, in, in similar question, I mean, in that sense, uh, do you think something different at play when it comes to, say, wealthier nations in Europe, the tension between uh, what, what is fine dining, nutritious, healthy food versus processed food, which increasingly kids might consume, uh, snacks and, you know, high fat, high sort of processed carbs uh, kind of tension that you find uh, in the West. Is that, is that something, uh, how are sort of how people dealing with that tension in, in that part of the world? I think it's also that uh, uh, nutritious food or, or healthy food has become too, too, um, uh, too marked as uh, such. So it, so it becomes, um, or, or the places, for example, the organic stores, there are many, many different kinds of uh, uh, brands of organic stores in France, but they are, they are actually very intimidating. Uh, they, are, they are expensive. Uh, true, but uh, of course we buy much less there. Uh, but there are also you, you you see the kind of people who go there. You you almost don't feel like you can you have the right to enter. So I think it's also very much about how the the place advertises uh, health or advertises its uh, almost its moral superiority uh, around the topic. And and I think that can also put as a very symbolic barrier uh, for for people. So, uh, the, the other question from the audience, this is uh, Sashindran. Uh, and he asks, uh, as pointed out, natural varieties, or traditional varieties are dying out fast um, and, the, and the water table is being drained in many places by bad choices of these. So, are we doomed to consume genetically modified food unknowingly? Uh, what are the fallouts of such Frankenstein foods? Um, have they been analyzed? Is there any way out? I think, I think the genetically modified question is uh, sort of a side story in this. Because, I, you know, everything is genetically modified, including, um, you know, basmati rice didn't exist. It, it was created. Most, most mangoes are not, don't breed true. So, you know, you, they're all genetically modified. I, I, I think that that's a... Uh, I, I, I don't know that, I'm not saying that there is no danger in gene genetically modifying, there might well be in some cases, but I think the question of, of uh, what is sustainable, it wasn't that traditional agriculture was very innovative in modifying foods. I mean, the, everything we eat today is modified. The wheat we eat is modified even before uh, Monsanto was uh, born. Uh, there were people were genetically modifying foods all the time, and and they modified them for particular purposes of sus being sustainable and productive and tasty in that context. We have to. For, I, I think one needs to. So I think a lot of the genetically mo modified foods are actually what we love. Yeah. Uh, we shouldn't forget that. So I, I think one should get. I think there well may well be evidence that specific forms of gen genetic modification are I either bad for us or bad for the farmer, and I'm, I'm perfectly sensitive to that. But I think one shouldn't get into this question of gen genetically modified. There was some pure food that existed which we just could reach and get. Uh, it doesn't exist. There's no mango that be breeds true that you want to eat. And, and also, I guess those, those varieties also fed a s fraction of the population that we need to feed now. And, uh, and the other... Yeah, that's also true. Yeah. And, and the... Uh, it is also possible that in, in a world ravaged by climate change, you would have to figure out ways by which you can create genetically modified versions that can grow like in the middle of a desert, right? As yeah, I mean, whether Monsanto should be doing the genetically modifying or not is a, is a very different question. I don't, exactly, don't yeah. know that I want Monsanto to be doing it. Yeah. But I think that that's a reason for, 
uh, you know, the International Crop Research Institute, which invented all the uh, rices that feed us in India today, is also, they genetically modify rice. They cross one rice with another rice to get what they're getting. This, this, this is, I think the, the word genetically modified is too broad and not helpful in my view. Yeah, I, I, I just thought I'll share a small anecdote and then we'll get to the questions. He, he spoke about genetically modified. Uh, as Malayalis, I know you might know this Tamil film song, one of its rice is Andangaka Kodilakari and then one of the lines is IR et Pallukkari. What, you, what is IR8 is actually a genetically modified variety of rice that saved India from starvation. And it's supposed to be like super white. So it describes a girl with teeth as white as IR8 rice. So that's literally a film song as well. So genetically modified food is not as bad as you think. Um, so maybe before we get to audience questions, I just wanted two very lightweight questions I had. Uh, one, put you on the spot and ask you, other than Bengali uh, food, what is your favorite Indian regional cuisine? You know, I would say, I, I, this is absolutely not to flatter you, but I would say, I, I mean, I love Andhra food, Telugu food, and, my, uh, and uh, Kerala food. I, I think that's my, uh, and if you yeah. look at the book, this, the, the, the dominant second cuisine, and maybe even equal proportions Bengali food is South Indian food of different kinds. So I'm a I'm big fan of South Indian food. I also like Maharashtrian food. I'm half Maharashtrian, and I like Maharashtrian food. It's very basic, earthy, but quite wonderful. Um, Super. So, um, and Shayan, you know, uh, as someone who's now experienced Indian food from all over, South Indian vegetarian food or North Indian vegetarian food? Which one would you prefer? Oh, South Indian, definitely. Uh, every <laughs> time, every time I visit cooks, uh, South Indian, he sees my smile going uh, up. So, uh, yeah. yes, All right. Definitely. So, on that note, I think we have time for some audience questions. So, let's go with this gentleman right up front. Yeah. Okay. Hello. So yesterday I bought the book and when I went to pay, it was like $20. So I was thinking, Abhijit Banerjee is talking about poor economics and giving us a big book of $20. But when I started reading it, I could pay 2,000 rupees for it. So there's a lot of information, humor and a lot of effort has got into it. So I agree. And the illustrations are also good. Okay, my question is, while writing the book, have you considered the average cost of making those food? And what is the range of that? You know, most of the dishes in the book are very, very cheap. And uh, that's part of, uh, you know, because they come from the way we live, which is, you know, not to live on very expensive sum. Is this a real, the re only reason I stand by the recipes is because it's what we eat every day. It's my, my family eats those recipes. I, I make them, every single one of them is cooked. I mean, maybe there's one cake there which I wouldn't say I cook every week. But there's most of those things I cook often. And I think that's, so I think I would, there are things I have actually, when, when I have, there is an expensive ingredient, there's one pasta with botarga, which is an expensive ingredient. Uh, expensive, not in a, you know, in the sense of, you know, you, the amount of botarga you use in making the pasta dish will cost you maybe 800 rupees. So it's not cheap, but it's not fine dining costs. I don't think there's anything there that you need in the book that will require you to spend, you know, more than, uh, you know, thousand rupees to make. No, I think I can vouch for the fact that he has well and truly made sure that some of the ingredients are like very affordable because there is one king blue, uh, blue fish recipe. And he says, if you don't have access to that fish, use basa, right? Basa is one of the cheapest fishes you can buy. That something a catfish coming from uh, uh, Burma or Thailand or Vietnam is cheaper than local fish is a separate problem, but well and truly many of those recipes are very, very uh, 
thought out. All right. The yes, that uh, all right. Uh, this girl right up here. Yes. Hello. Um, the kitchen has always been romanticized as a space. However, it is also a site for a lot of struggle and contestation. I'm especially looking in terms of women refusing to cede their territory in the kitchen, grandmothers refusing to t talk, uh, pass on their recipes when it comes to pickles, and that is something that we find in a lot of household households. How do you look at it, uh, this this site, kitchen as a site? Thank you. You know, I uh, I. Uh I would say that it's absolutely that, which is that, you know, it's one of the places where um, women, I, I, in the book we actually, uh, there's a little bit of, you know, relatively, uh, you know, lighthearted discussion of the male role in cooking and the particular male role, which is often much more sound and fury than, than performance. So it is, a, and so I, I think that there is a, I think the I think one of the things that clearly has been um, you know formative in my own experience is the fact that you know it's not that I could learn cooking by asking my mother, but I could learn more cooking by sitting there and doing something for her, and then she would basically uh, be doing things, and I and then I could record that uh, in my memory. And I, I realize, even now, I realize that, you know, when I do certain hand actions, I'm, I'm imitating my mother perfectly. It's really very, very interesting how much of this is, is knowledge that you get not by sort of, it's, 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 uh, it, it's, uh, it's not uh, knowledge that's codified. It's knowledge that, you know, is, is somehow observed in the, in the making. And I, I think that that's, a, that's something that, for me, in my life, is very important, mean very important. Right? And I think, yes, that's the, yeah, this, you right here, yes. Hi, good afternoon. So I wanted to ask uh, all of you, what is your take on, you know, probably, it could be any food for that matter, but to give a better example of how you guys mentioned cultural appropriation with food, right? So there's these cooks in the West, people like Jamie Oliver or Nigella Lawson who take Indian food and I don't know what they do to it, but it's, I, I get that there's fusion involved, but at some points to bring out the best of the cuisine, you don't tend to stay authentic. For example, Jamie Oliver's adding mango chutney in butter chicken or Nigella Lawson is making some form of Kerala and fish curry, which word, that word doesn't even exist here. So I just want to know what your take is on that. Oh, I'm all for it. I'm going to let him also answer, but I'm all yeah. for it. Yeah. That, that's exactly what I want them to do, is to, to learn uh, the technique and then play with it. it, it it's more, uh, I think it's when you, when you try to imagine a, a different flavor palette. When uh, using, the, you know, mango chutney to a butter chicken is, you know, I I could imagine, I don't so much love butter chicken, so I might imagine spiking it with some mango chutney. It sounds very much in the grammar of, of Indian eating. I, I, I'm, I'm very much for that, in a sense. I, I don't want, I, I think when it's, when you when you try to do butter foie gras, then I, then I worry more about it. <laughs> Shane, your thoughts on uh, cultural appropriation? Uh, I think it's also, it's, it's like for any artistic inspiration, you, n you never, you never take the whole thing. You always take one bit somewhere, you take another bit somewhere. So you, you're, never, you're never depriving the whole thing of its meaning. And, that, and that's when it gets uh, 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 difficult and dangerous. You, you're always uh, thinking somehow the, the, the upper layer and you're bringing it some, uh, somewhere else. So I think it can only be uh, prolific. Now, I think my, my only point of view is that uh, I, I, I guess the angst comes from the fact that these are global celebrities. Right? Uh, I don't know whether we'd have the same concern if a, a South Indian chef takes a Punjabi dish but adds a curry leaf tadka to bring about another flavor. Would you have the same problem with him as you would with, say, a Nigella Lawson? So there is a power dynamic, I guess, that you're referring to. But I'm, I agree with Abhijit that uh, the more you experiment, the more these methods become more global. I think it only helps Indian food uh, uh, 
uh, get a better, uh, wider range of Indian foods, get that kind of visibility. So, you know, as they say, all, all PR is good PR, you know, in, 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 in the food business. All right. Um, one minute. So I think one last question. Yes, this. Yes. Mike, Mike, Mike. Can I speak? Yes, yes, go ahead. Oh, wait, wait, oh, hold on. I want to know about the food, uh, pollutants that have entered into our raw foods. You see only green bananas that are being transported, at least in the north. You see raw mangoes that are left to ripen after a few days. You hear of chemicals added. You hear of uh, acid used for cleaning ginger, for example. Uh, colors used to make peas look green. How can we stop that and where? I, I mean, that's, this is exactly the kind of thing that the state exists to do. I mean, there's no, I mean, I, I take you the one that's really frightening. Uh, turmeric, to make it yellow, people are putting uh, lead and cadmium. And uh, that's really, for, for children, it's, prop, it's uh, brain development is uh, hurt by that. It's really extraordinarily frightening, but it's not, we, it's not individuals who are going to do it. This, that's the state's job. We have actually a food uh, quality regulatory body. Uh, the fact that it doesn't, uh, it, it sort of doesn't have the reach, the resources. It's, I've been there. It's actually well-meaning people, but with very little resources. Uh, you know, you, we need, I think exactly for the reason you're saying, we need 10 times the resources for that. I mean, it's really an absolute critical uh, need of the hour. We should just pour a 10 times. It should be a huge organization in a country as diverse as India where people eat very different things. We just don't have the scale I in doing that. We have an organization. Yeah, good here. So, um, unfortunately, time's up, and uh, you've been a fantastic audience. Uh, thank you, Abhijit, thank you. for being a, a fantastic you. guest, and Shine as well. Uh, I know I probably surprised you with some of the questions, but uh, do get cooking to save your life. It absolutely, you know, even if it doesn't save your life, it's still a wonderful read. Uh, it's humorous. Um, it'll get you more insighted about the issues about sustainability and other topics, not just the recipes, while you're making absolutely fantastic food to entertain your family and friends. On that note, uh, thank it you. It comes from cooking to, s you, from the American expression, I can't cook to save my life. <laughs> and, and the claim is everyone can cook, can cook to save their lives. Indeed. Thank you.